Ian and Sam are with us who own the farm, but we were here this morning. So, and, and this is not about, we're not, we're not criticising the system here. This is a, a sort of teaching aid and to get you off your seat and freeze you to death on a farm. It's simple as that. Um, so this is a, just a little quick look at the hardware side of things. So those three circles. Again, just a very brief one on the hardware, but if there's burning, if there's other other questions, other things might come into it as well on the software side. So I'm very mindful. I've got quite a lot of health and safety executive people here, rather than practicing farmers. Sorry, um, and maybe Hillsborough is a slightly different situation as well. So we'll try and give a general overview and maybe some pointers to help in in, in all situations. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you know, the basis of a very standard layout. Um, every single farm will be different. Uh, their, their workforce is different. Their, their animals are different. Their, you know, whether you're a suckler herd or a finishing unit or a day, it's all slightly different. So design of systems has got to be very much part of a design process with the farm that you deal with. So I will try and stick to one or two tips that people might be able to walk away with rather than going, you know, you should do this, this and this. Because until you get onto your farm and see your circumstances, that's a very dangerous game to play in my view. And I tend, tend to avoid it. Um, so in terms of the general handling system, you've got what I call the big five here. So you've got to have a holding area generally. Yeah. You're going to have a crowd pen, which is something before the animal gets up the race, which is up here. We'll have a look. You're going to have the race itself. We're going to have something like a, a crush, okay, or a headstock, and then we're going to have an exit strategy. And the, the vast majority of handling systems that you see are basically broken down into those sort of five things. Now, Hillsborough might handle things on a very different individual one-to-one -one basis, but lots of farms will have a simple setup just like this. So what are we looking for? And I'll take it very much on, a, um, on, a, on the basics, yeah? So when you go into a system, this is what we're looking for. So holding pen, what do you need? And this is before we try and get anything in to a crowd pen or anything else like that. What are you looking for? Think about some of the things that we've talked about already. What, 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 how would your holding pen be designed or what would it look like? It needs to be secure. It needs to be secure. So the first thing is what I call containment. So how high should rails be, do you think? Huh? That's not bad. That's not bad. OK. General rule of thumb is that the top rail should be over the head of the animal in the head up position, the biggest animal in the head up position. Yeah, because that means that if, if, they get, if they do jump, particularly on open rails, and they get one or two foot up onto here, it means the shoulder is still, they can't roll over it, OK? We have in the UK, we have guidance, which is about 1.5 metres. But if you're, if you're handling continentals, that would be seen as far too low. So this is probably about slightly over 1.5, I think, so gra grand. Um, you know, if you're handling big continentals, you're looking at 1.6 to 1.8 in height. But the general rule of thumb is over the head of the biggest animal in the head-up position. Now, what might our exception to be that rule to be? Who is less likely to be jumping over things? Dairy cows, yeah. So, so you can you can use a little bit of um, you know risk assessment. A dairy cow, you're more likely to get containment a little bit lower on, and it's not going to be a major issue. Okay, so that's the first thing. Is it secure? Next thing, then, what you're looking for in your holding area? Do you think? You're all very quiet. Should it be closed in? What do you think? A holding area before you're closed in or not? I think you have to because a holding area is a sort of waiting bit and, I, and, and it depends on how long you're holding for. I personally would try and avoid closing things down too much because cattle can get quite anxious. 
So in the initial holding area, I would say no. It's, it's reasonable to leave it um, open-sided for the vast majority of the time if you want. But what must you give the animals? Space. And that's because of the, the, that personal space thing, OK? You don't want cattle to be jammed up to, shoulder to shoulder together for a long period of time because that will start conflict. And again, don't believe anything. Just go and look when you see the cattle being handled. Are they, are they sort of conflicting with each other? Because you've already started to raise the heart rate at that point. So we're looking where animals can get out of each other's way a little bit. Yeah? So that's containment and plenty of space. Then what are we looking for? Corners. We'll worry about corners in a minute because we can, you know, this is a holding area. This is somewhere where you want to get your 30 or 40 bullocks in from a section of the shed or, you know. But what else do we need at that point? What was one of those fear triggers? Falling. To the Falling to the floor. And again, it's like handling human beings. If we don't get the floor right very, very early on, that's going to start to elevate the heart rate before you know it. So getting good footing at that point is, is pretty important. So, so good flooring. So that's why, you know, holding areas, you know, it, it depends on, you know, markets and slaughterhouses are very different, but sometimes just rough flooring where they've got good grip on is perfectly fine because you're not worried about cleaning and disinfection particularly. Okay? And then our final one, that's not the only one, but it's my, on my list of four, uh, are you in, in or out of the cattle space at that point? In the holding pen, is it difficult to be out of the space? Most of the time, you're having to move cattle into that space and then out into, the, into a <coughs> crowd pen, aren't you? So what do we need to make sure in that holding area that, 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 that people have got? So escape route. And again, I will just go through what I think is, again, a little rule of thumb is over, under, behind, or through, <coughs> okay? This is a dynamic health and safety risk assessment. So it's, it's pertinent to every single farm, but different on every single farm. So when you're in the space with the cattle, yeah, depending on who's working there, and um, we're looking at Sam, Sam can lift, can, can leap over a tall building because he's young, I can't, I've got a double hip replacement. Yeah, and there's certain things that I, probably could do in an emergency but are not dynamically going to do yeah and um, <clears throat> so who's working there so if you've got father or a neighbor who's 74 years old with his knee replacement good idea it, you know you <clears throat> so if we look at the holding area here the holding area is beyond th this gate and so what we've got is we've got open rails at one end or the other so we have got an escape route. It wouldn't be an under, unless you're very thin, and I'm looking at, um, I've forgotten your name. She might be able, you might be able to get under that, and I'm looking for the really stick thin people. Might get, but most of the time you'd be over the top of the rail, wouldn't you? And again, stupid little things, if, you're, if your fathers and uncles and what have you, they've got hip problems, they will struggle on that, on that first, footing yeah because that's one of the things that's really difficult to do um, so you can see that you know we are we are I think the technical word is stuffed either side of there but we've got escape front and back okay but it's just worth thinking when I'm in here how do I get out and mentally that's what we need to change farmers thinking to yeah and the first thing before you go in the cat is how do I get out the, lo the chances of that happen are still quite low but that's the problem is because usually people get stuck because it's the, the one chance in 10,000 and then all of a sudden we can't get out. Yep. So let's wander up here. So that's your, a little bit on your, um, on your holding area. So you asked about corners. Why, why corners not so good? Cows don't do corners very well. Uh, sometimes if you have, if you have square pens, uh, a very quick way to get rid of corners and actually give a safety escape, if it's feasible, is to put two drop posts in across the corner and a bit of sheeting and you've got somewhere you can get behind. And it also takes out the corner.
very, very simple thing to do, you know, not rocket science at all, but every layout will be slightly different about where it might be sensible to put them. It'll be difficult in here because you've got a gate coming through, so you don't want to, you don't want to block the access point, um, although you could put it either side of that, so it'll gives you, it gives you both, doesn't it? So uh, we're going to bring the cows in. Sorry, cow. Bring your gate round. Have you fixed the gate yet, Sam? So this is another. This is another little. It's a minor, minor safety point. Doesn't cost a lot of money. It's in your own system when you know which gate drops, and which gate you might need to give a little lift to. But if you've got neighbours or what have you helping, it's important that you go round and check gates and things like that. They, they are working easily and smoothly. Because although you remember that on gate number six you have to lift it, and in a hurry you'll probably remember it because you're so used to it, your neighbour might not remember that one. So I'm a bit of a stickler, as you'd expect, around the abattoir on the market for making sure things are properly maintained and all gates work pretty fast and pretty efficient. Okay, so how many people either on the... You know, on their own farm or other farms, see, we get to this point where we're bringing in a group of cattle, trying to get them up the race, and they start to turn. Yeah? Common, very common. Oh, Hillsborough all nodding, so we've not moved. It's all a bit of a. Is that right? Yeah. Don't worry, I'll sign off a big budget for you to go back with. Okay. Um, and it's a common thing, and this is where we probably have our highest risk and most accidents. Um, are, are the bigger farms are now putting in round pens and bits and pieces where you, we can actually operate outside of the animal space. But in, in a setup like this, just as a simple, um, let's sort it out, let's find out what the problem area is. So Sam and Ian have already admitted to they get a bit of turning here. Okay, so we'll take sample cow here, come hither, and we're just going to look at, just do a very simple exercise. So. Stick your, stick your glasses on. OK, and I'm going to manhandle the cow, as you do. And I'm going to put you here. God, this very immovable cow. Can you see your way down the race? Yeah. Right. Take one step to your left and angle yourself a little bit. Can you still... Can, no. Can you stay down the race? No. No. Take another little step to your left. Can you see down the race? No, not at all. But you can see somewhere out there. Yeah, yeah. So quite critical just w look where he's standing okay what's that angle about 30 degrees yeah so because of the binocular vision we sort of lose sight of something after we're 30 degrees out of it okay so quite often to get to help cows see where we want them to go we need to have instead of setting up a funnel like that at 45 degrees set up one straight side, 130 degrees, yeah? Because that means that the animal then, this animal can see straight down, this one still has sight of it, and so when one goes, the other one goes. And the other thing is, you bring something out at a 30 degree angle, the only place a cow can plant themselves is quite a way away from the race entrance, yeah? Whereas if you set something up like that, with a straight bit, it just gives you the shape to create that turning all the time, yeah? So straight side, 30 degree angle. Um, bringing cows to approach this way. God, he's very, just relax, just chill. Okay, Whew. you know. So you, remember what I said about that, just go towards that wall and tell me when you think you've got there. Yeah, so he's hesitated already, okay? That's the difference between that big black wall, solid wall that you can't see. So we have to get our, so the likelihood of a cow then turning its head the right direction and then heading down the raceway. However, what's the big benefit of this layout? Which means when they get them turned in the right direction, they're going to go. Because where's the handler? Yeah, but in relation to the, move, the cow, where's, where are our handlers? Left-hand side or right-hand side? Oh, yes. And we have, I haven't been, apart from this morning when I first came down, They've got another system which is right-handed, not as good. Yeah, so don't believe any of that tell you, just go and see. You can take your glasses off now, unless you're absolutely intense on doing it. <laughs> and just relax, okay. So, 
So that's a very simple thing if you get turning, and I'd always advise farmers just to go and have a look at their system, and decide, you know, just make a little X on the, on the system over a couple of months or a couple of handling times and go, what's working and what isn't? So if it's the bit that's not working, let's work out where it is, okay? Then go back and look at it and do make one little change at a time. Do not suddenly go, we're going to do all of this because you'll end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah? Because some of these little systems work very, very well simply because it's going left-handed. Whereas you might reverse the whole thing the other side and all of a sudden it doesn't work. Yeah? So that's your crowd pen um, area to think about. Uh, group size. Uh, it's quicker to move four groups of five than one group of 20, isn't it? And because what you're doing is you, you're inadvertently giving the animals more space all the time so they can actually move. Um, but you're also um, splitting up the influence of a dominant animal. We do it, I'm looking at the youngsters here. Sam, you don't have to admit to this. You, what will happen quite often, if you're coming out of a nightclub these days, you'll see the security staff will actually split and divide and split and divide and split and divide, won't they? Because if they leave the mob to get together, then all of a sudden the bad behavior starts. So they will take you away in a little group. We load planes that way, we do lots of things like that where we're taking a little group at a time because it's actually faster. So matching your crowd pen size with your race. So we've got five, six in here, and we try and keep five, six in here, particularly when we've got a one-man operation going on. OK? So same thing, is, is, is try and match one with the other. Generally speaking, if you're on a finishing unit, you'll see big, big, long races, because they tend to do quicker things. Yeah? So people that are weighing regularly or something like that, you can get away with a longer race. How long should the race be? How long's a cow? Does anybody know how long a cow is? 2.4 huh? meters. I've got Dexter's, now what are you gonna do? And that's what smart farmers say to me. So it, I always say go out and measure your cows basically because you might have Dexter's or you might have a, something with a Kianina in it and suddenly you know you are talking about 2.4 meters. Um, so nose to tail what they are. Um, you know, we work on usually about one, what I call anything between 1.8 to 2 metres. Stacked is what we call them. So you can have one behind or you can stack them where you get the, the head to come up. So, um, so it's not so much the length of the race in terms of, uh, in terms of dimensions, it's how long the animals are waiting. So the, the Length of the race or how many cattle go in the race is dependent on what you're doing the other end. So the reasoning behind that is cattle will, the heart rate will start to go up after about eight minutes standing still in the race. So quite often the one that's most awkward to handle is the one at the back of the queue. Welcome to Tesco. Right? So we, and I've, I've challenged my last group this morning, next time you're stuck in traffic, just keep an eye on the watch or the clock, and just see after about how many minutes it takes before you're getting really fed up. Yep, and it's probably only three to four minutes actually. Um, and that's what happens with the cattle. They are standing stationary. Somebody is flashing lights behind them, trying to push them to move. You can't go any move anywhere, or you're standing behind the queue and somebody's like this all the time, and you're getting pretty fed up, aren't you? So if you've got a slow job at that end, put less animals in the race. Um, if it's got a fast job, you can have a big long race and you get much more of a flow going through. So that's the principle on the, t on who's heard of Temple Grandin? We've got one temple. Who's heard of Temple? I'm expecting a lot of people to hear. So again, just think, you know, from Temple's layouts, you know, we've got 10,000 cattle on a feedlot. We are running cattle at a hell of a speed, which we don't do in Ireland. There isn't a farm anything remotely close to the size of Kansas. So you have to be very careful, uh, unless you're getting good flows, you know, a little short race is probably just as, just as beneficial. It's about the waiting time. Yep? Can I ask you a question? What about giving cattle too much room? 
What about giving cash? Is it possible to give them too much room? Forwards or backwards? Well, either way, if it's just a race, I guess if you only two in there, yeah. you'd use one at the front doing something and the other one's up and down here. Yeah, why is the, uh, why is the animal going up and down? It's trying to escape. Yeah, but why? Next. No, no, but why? If you're, if you're alongside the animal, yeah. why is it going forward and backwards all the time? You're telling it to go forwards and backwards all the time, aren't you? Because the minute, if with an open side, it will talk to close and open side. If you've got an open sided race and somebody's on the crush, and this animal's got room to move back, it's going to back off you, isn't it? Because it's part of the flight's own business. Yeah. But once it hits the gate, feel something behind it, you just go forward again. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I, it's, a, it's a difficult one because I, I, if designing things, I always talk to farmers and go, right, how often are you going to handle small numbers? So people do handle small numbers for something like clipping, in which case the good strategy is to have a couple of those divider gates in, yeah, but so they're not running up and down the race all the time because that's what they will do. If you are, you know, if you're a finisher, you probably need, you probably would need maybe one gate at the most because uh, you can keep the flow going all the time. So again, suckler guys tend to do more things that take a longer time uh, and therefore would probably be better off with having more divisions. If you've got dividers, you can, you can make the race the size you need it for the animals you've got. If you've got no dividers, expect to get a lot of running up and down. Yep. And what do you think about bars instead of dividers? You put a hole in the wall and the bar comes to the side side. Why would Miriam go, I hate bars? Yeah. Bearing in mind my background. If you ever want to see your animal on the hook, and the amount of bruising that you can actually get across there now, most of you guys don't even have to worry about it. Yeah? But that is the one reason, is the fact that if, you, if you've got something pressed against a barbecue, if you're finishing it somewhere, you're going to get bruising across how expensive bit of meat. Yeah? So again, it's important that the, you know, any run back gate in a race, uh, you know, things like flick flat gates and what have you got. Remember, in somewhere like America or Australia or anything, they've got a constant movement. So that, that gate is nearly always up, yeah? Whereas we don't move animals fast enough. So a run back gate then suddenly becomes an obstruction and then the cattle won't move, yeah? I don't like things in the race myself personally. If I was going to go thrilling, I'd go for a slidey in and out gate because if the animal comes back against it, it's not going to. You can't, animals are less likely to get hooked up on anything, jump over it, jump under it, stab themselves with it, you name it, and I prefer to get them out, simply because we haven't got the movement going through. Yeah? Anybody else? You know, that's, that's my personal opinion, and most of the times, a lot of the abattoirs we work in, the first thing <coughs> we end up doing is taking out run-back gates, because, you know, we're more likely to have a slidey-up gate towards the top end so that once we've got an animal far enough over, we'll slide the gate, hold him in that space, and then take him as the next one, just to stop the yo-yo, just to make sure that we've got an animal ready presented to go. Yeah? So, solid or open sides? Why do we have solid sides on things? Has anybody got solid sides on their race at home? Hillsborough got a big curvy race, have you? Big roundy pen? No? Yeah, so why do you do it? Does it, does it work? Huh? Yeah, so why does it work? Why do we put solid sides on things? Not distracted. Not distracted, because again, the big peripheral vision means that you can pick up movement on either side. So here we've already got one big solid side. Now, generally when Ian and Sam are handling on their own, yeah, not a big issue because you've got one person in the right place, another person in the right place. When do we get our problems? When there's extra people down there because all of a sudden you've got lots of people there that you can't control their movement. So animals coming into the race are going to see a lot of movement, people in front, and then they're going to go, let's back off. So solid or open depends what you're trying to do. And I would just go, it's better off to play with one or two bits of sheeting to start with you know, are cattle running back? When do they run back? It's cause, and again, somewhere like the Hillsborough guys here, you're gonna, you've probably got a lot of people around sometimes a big, from a technician point of view, so you might need to do a little bit more um, than if it's a one-man operation. Putting things like, you know, sheeting, 
we could put another gate out and sheet it down to here and make ourselves a little collecting pen. When you start sheeting things, you've got to be very careful from the safety point of view. Because if you sheet things, then you can't get out. Yeah? So putting a bit of sheeting here or something like that, you've got to be careful that you can't. So generally speaking, any sheeted round or crowd pens, the handler works outside the crowd pen all the time. Because you can't work inside the crowd pen when it's sheeted. Uh, because you've got no way of getting out. OK? So. Uh, Can I ask another stupid question? Go on then. Yeah, keep, you keep going with the stupid question. I'm on pen. I'm making it here. A lot of guys will actually have the gate. And the gate will swing this way. This gate swings the other way. And what you do is you actually bring the gate around. Yeah. So you sort of put them into like a V. Yeah. But the gate is just depending on you holding it. And obviously they're pressed against it. Yep. Not advisable. Not advisable. Again, um, if you see any of the big... Um, uh, round pen operations at any of the abattoirs in Ireland and Northern Ireland, yeah. So um, that Miriam's rule of thumb is that the gate, if the cows touch the gate, that's all right. But you must never bring the gate to touch the cow. So if it's being used to guide the animals around and they've got space to go, that's one thing. But trying to physically force things round, it means that you're going to get smacked in the jaw usually or something will run back is because you're putting too much pressure on so there's a way of using a gate like that which is you know everybody tries to push animals around uh, there are things called bud systems as well which is probably too much to go into which is you know really really easy systems to to get to work and um, so generally speaking if you're pulling gates round you know uh, some form of lock off device so that if you bring it round and animals kick back then it's going to lock off and not not come back on you because that's a that that will be, these will end up in lots of minor injuries. Yeah. Okay, down the race then. We've done the length of the race and the time in the race, uh, sheeting or not. Yeah. So we could sheet this race. It's not the biggest issue. It's, it's this point here is the biggest issue here. So I wouldn't worry about sheeting for the time being. Um, uh, particularly as why are the cattle when they get in the race likely to carry on going what can we see a, a route out so again when you're looking at the handling system you go right once we get it, things like orientation ideally animals can will bounce back to where they came from or they've got they've got somewhere where they know they can go out so visually so we were talking this morning if we flip the whole thing over Okay, then all of a sudden you're heading cows towards a brick wall. All of a sudden you see how you do something sim simple like that. You don't think it makes any difference. And the reason why, what was the thought about flipping it over? Because what's the race doing? Ever so slightly. What's the gradient doing? It's going ever so slightly downhill. We haven't got a spirit level on it, but I, I can, I can, we can feel it a little bit. Now... Ideally, you want cows on the level, particularly through the race, the crush, um, or a little bit uphill because they find it easier to move. So the question is, if we're going to do a major improvement, if they are running down there anyway, and it's less of an issue, do we bother changing the whole thing around to get them to run uphill with a view that they might end up going? No, we don't. We just don't touch. Okay? It's worth thinking about because it, it, that's not a major gradient, but something a little bit more. Um, right, let's head down to the uh, crush bit. How many people here have walked your system the where the cows would go? Yeah? Have you walked the system where the cows would go? Because that's an, another really good point to do. Okay, so crush, uh, how many, this is a self-locking device. So crushes can be self-locking, scissor action, cages on the front or a squeeze. So how many people here have seen a squeeze crush or have got one? You got one? Do you love it? What's, what manufacturer is it? Don't just whisper. Huh? Oh, a what? Yeah, never heard of them. Okay. <laughs> So it's a fully lifting squeeze, and it yeah, but does it does it on the as a scissor gate? So it's not a but 
Yeah, but only on, only on a manual. Yeah, yeah, so it's not quite a squeeze crush. So we're on to the crush bit now. Now, remember all the things we said about what causes fear in animals? Isolation, being restrained. Uh, if you took your favourite pet dog down to the, the veterinary surgery and the surgeon, in order to restrain your dog, got hold of it by the throat and pinned it down, you'd be reporting them, wouldn't you? So what do we do to our cows? We grab them by the throat and expect to stand there going, yep, this is not a problem for me. So self-locking yoga is always a bit of a problem because after we do it a couple of times, cows go, nah, not going to play that game. The self-locking yokes were designed for dairy cows principally or very quiet animals, usually that are then also fed through a, um, a self-locking system. Because guess what, they, that learning bit, you know, who watches at open all hours? You know the till? Yeah, and you're laughing, but it's, you know, thinking, God, it's not rocket science at the end of the day, and yet we expect our cattle to do that. Well, why would they? Not that stupid. So, and you get some cows that are very, very canny, and before you know it, you've got your hand in there trying to pull the thing out, and that's where you get your hand trapped. Um, so, self-locking devices are good for quiet cows or dairy cows, but um, most people now are moving up to some form of scissor action, or better still, a proper big uh, a squeeze crush. Okay? Uh, squeeze crush is uh, uh, basically... Temple developed what we call the Boston holding technique for children. So it means that, you know, I'm going to give you a hug, basically. Uh, we do deer the same way. It's not, it, it's been, you know, and restraining any wild animal, we tend to sort of cover it and hold it with cats. You know, you don't get hold of a cat by the throat or a one limb, do you? You tend to wrap it in a towel and then all of a sudden the heart rate goes down and goes, I'm, I've been restrained. Um, so squeeze crushes do exactly the same thing. They actually bring um, light pressure all the way across the body, slightly lift the animals off the ground, and then you've got the animal completely restrained. Um, they are getting much more popular. They are expensive. The, the top end of them will be anything five, six, ten thousand pounds, but they are some of the best money that people will ever spend. And, and what I say to people in terms of money is that, you know, uh, if you look at how long this thing would last and how many cattle you handle, if you look at it on a pence per animal basis, it's not a great deal of money. But we sort of go, mm, we, don't, we, don't, we don't smart when we go and spend £10,000 on a bit of tractor stuff, but we do when it comes to cattle handling. Um, we don't have a private health service here. We've got a national health service that picks up the bill, which is why in America we've got really good handling facilities because the ranch picks up all the bills. Yep. And that's one of the, that's one of the issues, is that all across the world, everybody pays for their own private medical or have to pay insurance. And so we make things safe because people can't afford to pay the bills. Um, we had a little bit of discussion here this morning because we've got no way of holding the animal at the back here. She's just on her own, so she is going to pu pull back. Um, and we talked a little bit this morning about improving the floor surface here a little bit because they're slightly downhill you can sort of see a skid mark again where your cattle are slipping just check to see if there's something we can do with the floor so we looked we thought you know matting um uh your piece of well, some um your, your metal grids or bits of, but again it's it's look at your system where are animals slipping okay now now i'm going to let daisy out the other end okay the exit strategy here is the animals will go straight into the yard. What's the safety issue when you've got other m members of other people working here now? They'll come back on you. So, and I'm expecting the technicians to have a lot of empathy at this point. So quite often what we do is we have the end of the crush, we let them out and they're headed to the wild blue yonder. No cow ever comes back, does she? Do cows ever come back to say hello and fill in the paperwork? Or help you with a dosing gun? Yes? Yeah, they do, they do. And, and that's the problem, because actually what you want to do is say to the cows, right, away from me, particularly we've got people standing here. And I think this is particularly true if you've got, um, from, a, from a veterinary side or TB or something like that, 
These guys are entitled to have a protected working area. They've got a job to do. They, ha they might be writing things down or, or taking you know, blood sampling or what have you. They don't have eyes in the back of their head. So particularly when you've got other people, well, to be honest, anybody, because quite, quite often it's granny or aunt that's out here scribing, isn't it? And I talked to a lot of wives on the way round the road, and I said, if we got you a protected working area, would you be happy? And they go, yes, you keep going, Miriam. Okay, so um, if you can, find some way of protecting where the people are going to work. You know, because there is, albeit it's quite a small risk, but when cattle come back, they are going to bounce back. They might come back to where they come from, and then the, you've got a high risk of niggly little accidents um, that, that um, are a problem. Uh, Here's quite simple, but you know, more sophisticated if you've got a sorting gate or what have you. Uh, some of my little Welsh farmers, you know, we've got quite small farms as well. They're getting quite uh, inventive. They're putting um, the crush or the holding pen here, followed by a weigh crate and another one, so that on a weighing day, everybody gets to move through the crush without being caught, and then you're walking through the, the rest of, and you've got some way of holding. So they learn that crush does not mean fight and go. Because here, what you're saying, if the harder you fight, the reward for fighting is we're going to let you out. So we get, suddenly get, then get bad, bad behavior or not control behavior. So anybody got any burning questions? We're all a bit gobsmacked today. No. Huh? What sort of bull is it? Ooh. <coughs> What's everybody else's thoughts on the bull running with a cow in the parlour? I'm I'm less worried about it when it gets in the parlour. I'm more worried about it before it gets to there. Wouldn't you be? So again, do we have a problem as long as we've got safety exits all the way through? She, he's, probably happily, he's probably happier with his cows, isn't he? And again, but because you've got a bull in there, you need to be very, very aware on the safety side of it, wouldn't you? Because if he does time to take umbrage, you need to be able to get out of the way. So can you, can you get your cows into the parlour without getting into the cow space? No. So, you know, dynamic risk assessment. So we had a little bit of conversation this morning about cows and calves generally as well. So why are cows and calves a big risk area? Huh? Hormones and, and, and natural protection from mum. You know, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've had a cow and how quiet you think she is, you put your instinctive bit at the back of your head. So instinctively, if somebody comes up to look at my calf or stick a, something in its ear or advance with a spray gun or anything, what is mother instinctively going to worry about? You're attacking my calf. What are you going to do? Oh, you're going to protect the calf, you know? The fact that so many cows tolerate us actually intervening at those key moments is, is testament to what gentle animals they actually naturally would be. These guys are only doing what's perfectly normal for them, you know, but we sort of lost the plot a little bit. And a lot of that might be not so much in the farming world, but when it comes to walkers and things like that, it's because we've got a lot of bad images on television you know, that goes, it's, you know, they go up and tease animals and, you know, chase them around fields and all sorts of things instead of respecting the fact that it's not that she or he is naturally dangerous, it's just the sheer size and bulk of them which will take you out. And I was asked to do a, um, a program on, with Animal Planet in, in America where there's a bit of a, um, uh, hobby for keeping single bulls as pets um, and needless to say somebody got killed 
and they wanted me to come and do something like a Caesar Milan to sort the bull out for the bull behaviour. And not, I said to them, I said, absolutely no. One, because I'm not an idiot. But two, is that how do I, 10% of the weight of that animal, possibly control it and go, no bull, you shouldn't do that. Just, it's impossible to do. Um, I, the bull was in isolation. You know, it was on its own. Uh, we got mixed up with the, um, the, the relationship between the human and the animal. So another little test for you. Who's more dominant, the animal being groomed or the groomer? So if you see cattle interacting, who's more dominant, the groomer, the, the animal being groomed or the groomer? The one being groomed is the dominant one. So, what happens when you start cutching your cattle, which is scratching their lugs and going, ah, oh, you're a mate? Flattened eventually. Huh? You get flattened eventually. Because to be, when, we're in a learning si when we're in a calm situation, then the learning is fine, yeah? Because I'm, I'm happily going to let my ears be cutched. But when we're in a high, you know, a high intensity situation, something like a TB test, all of a sudden we revert to our instinct. One of our farmers was killed in Wales because they decided to leave the bull to the end of the test um, because the farmer said, he's very quiet, he'll be fine. Okay, so fine, yeah. Um, but he went to get the bull right at the end of the day and he never came out alive. And that's because all through that morning or that day, what was the bull hearing? You know, the, the, there'll be more activity, more noise on the farm. So he already was in... You know, he was on his instincts, not on his learning, and therefore, so two lessons learned. Put your bull through first third, and never, never let anybody go in to get a bull on its own in a situation like that. Simple. Okay? What about when, Miriam, you occasionally hear people saying they're petting calves, or you're stroking a calf, and they say, rather than stroking the top of the head, yeah. Area or if you're absolutely, the animal is more likely to do that rather than to pet down an attacker. Well, really, you discourage all of that. Well, because it, it, it entirely, it, I, I work, I've been working with a lot of dairy farmers, and a lot of um, our bigger dairy farms are putting calves out, bed and breakfast rearing systems, and you, you know some of them are going thinking actually, you know, all the heifer calves that came back, they started to get really difficult to move. And that's because somebody had been over interacting with them. So suddenly the animals just want to come to you and will not drive away. Because you've taught them to come to me, da da da, you know, instead of learning that you go away from me, you go away from me, go away from me. Yep. So black and white bull calves don't touch them because somebody's going to, we're going to have them down the abattoir. I'd, the hardest thing for me to ever handle is black and white bull calf, particularly that's been fairly intensively reared that somebody has cutched because they suddenly get to 450, 500 kilos. They've never learned about being a cow, have they? Yep, so they're, they're a bit skew whiff anyway. Yep, so I would personally avoid all contact. Where's the best place to contact a cow if you want to cutch them? Where does, where does mummy cow, where does mummy cow pay attention to? Come on, farmers, veterinarians, yeah, or the tail head, yeah, and horses are the same as well. That top of the tail head is a, is a nice place, and if you want to cut in there, you scratch in there as well, rather than the front end. But I'm a, I used to be very hands-on, but working with animals around the abattoir don't touch, is, is my view, because touch anywhere on the body is actually the response you're more likely to get from an animal is what? What's the default position? Why do you have to worry about touching a cow anywhere? Because, you know, it, instinctively, we're just going to try and get rid of it, aren't we? You know, particularly in, in around the flank and places like that, you know, because guess what? That flank attack is like somebody's attacking the side. So that's why when you're caesareans, you want to get the leg strapped up and all the rest of it, don't you? Because the likelihood of something kicking out is pretty high. So, you know, treat with caution.
good. Is there any advice on loading cattle on the trailers? Because I've seen the difference between a clean trailer and a trailer that's dirty. Yeah. Kind of put on a clean trailer, they don't want to go on, whereas if there's high dung and stuff on it, they're more inclined to go a bit quicker. Yeah. Here we load single file out here. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, the trouble is you're supposed to have your vehicle clean anyway. So, we, uh, you know, we've got to be careful here because I don't want to, I don't want to mix the animal behaviour from the, from the sort of good practice, which is a clean trailer. But as you would expect, if something's, because if something's bright and shiny with a dead end, with, with a dead end and that maybe is cleansed and disinfected, that's telling me don't go into that trailer. Um, some of our trailers now, they've got uh, matte black or grey paint going down. Um, the pig guys have started to put on uh, what they've, their finishing operation is, is apple or citrus into the disinfection. Because <laughs> that's like, you think it's weird, but if you've got a, you know, if you've got a load, you know, two, three, four hundred pigs at four o'clock in the morning, and they've all decided it's melt, something as daft as that, they go, right, let's disinfect it with something like, with, with an apple or something like that. Um, so. We have to be careful about the shit. Uh, in a fear state, cows will shit. Yep. And they'll wee, won't they? That's on a different mechanism, release mechanism from normal shitting and weeing, isn't it? I'm looking at the vet. Yep, yeah. yeah, it is. It is. So it's adrenaline induced. So there's a little word that says, switch the camera off now, when the shit hits the fan. That's where the saying comes from. So there is good shit and there is bad shit. Okay, so, but <laughs> so sometimes you can get some bad shit, and sometimes you can get some good shit. I'd be absolutely on your side, but unfortunately we have to think, keep things cleansed and disinfected. I'd be more likely to put down straw or shavings or just something to actually um, disguise the, the thing. Or just give them a bit of blinking time. You know, if they're completely blocked off and can't go out anywhere at all, then you've just got to be a little bit patient. I think sometimes we end up pushing far too quickly. Um, you know, loading on here, the other thing that we talked about today is, is, is do the frustration thing. So hold the animals into a confined space and go, right, no. And then go. So using things to say, right, no, you're not going to go there. And after a while, they go, actually, you do want to go there. Instead of what we tend to do is present them with a trailer and push them straight away, don't we? Instead of actually maybe holding them back, confining them from the back, and then opening it, and then let them go. A bit of reverse psychology. Yeah? Good. What about then, uh, when we're having a problem occasionally, and more and more, is public going into cross fields or whatever, Miriam, and the cattle in fields and being attacked and things? Yeah. There. Well, more and more these days, our prob we, we've got the same problem happening all over. Um, and there's, there's a couple of issues. Is one is that it's a public right of way, but a lot of farmers are now basically um, giving walkers an alternative. If they've got cattle in the field, they will mark, instead of the, the path running right across the field where there's a high risk of you separating cows and calves, for instance. You know, because the, car the calf will be lying out to one side, the cow's on the other, and as somebody walks through, they don't realise they've split the two up. Yeah, and then that, that's where your accidents happen. Um, so basically diverting the path, putting up a temporary um, electric fence or something, uh, and giving the walkers the option at that point to go, you know, there's the foot public footpath. You're perfectly free to walk through the public footpath. However... If you're not confident with cows or you have maybe mobility issues, we've provided an alternative which is safe and cattle-free zone. Yeah? We, need, oh, we were talking this morning, we need to do an awful lot more uh, NFU, Ulster Farmers Union, do a lot more um, liaison with things like the Ramblers Association because a lot of them are completely unaware of the potential risks. Uh, they tend to think that farmers are being awkward and difficult. So we had a first meeting down in um, uh, the southwest of England because we've got a lot of public footpaths and a lot of visitors. Um, and it was, really, it was really productive because at the end of the day, nobody, 
people want to walk, nobody wants to get hurt. Um, and it was, it was a very, very productive meeting, particularly as then we did some um, uh, article in the Ramblers magazine about how do cows see. They've also got signs the Kennel Club have, have done with them about if you're, if you're walking with your dog and the cows are approaching you, you let your dog off the lead and go. Okay? Our problem was when the policemen came up later on who they're police dog handlers and they're chasing murderers across fields and they go, I can't let go of the dog because he might just kill somebody. So now what do I do? I said, well, that's, we went off, we'll have another day with them because they've got a big dynamic risk assessment to make. But they were, they were running through fields with a load of dogs chasing somebody and next minute they hear the, Cal the Calgary stampede after them. And you've never seen some, she's, and big, big, big policemen going, didn't like that. <laughs> Scary. So, um, and again, a lot of the issues, some of our walkers are actually quite elderly. You know, they, you know, they, are lim they also make a lot of noise. They also usually have got quite bright clothing on and therefore will be seen as a novel object. And if there's a mass of them and they're all gibbering away like that, and particularly if they've got dogs with them, they're going to be perceived by the animals as a threat. Yeah. And it's a, you know, I show, you know, I'm in the, I'm on the showing circuit, and I think we just have to be, um, again, you know, just because your animal handles very, very well at home does not mean to say that it's going to handle well. Um, and there's a slight, well, get on and do it instead of looking at the safety aspect. So, um, I think again, it's it's about ha it's about having your instinctive head on a little bit. So um, most cattle, because you are teaching them, uh, will learn that this is what they do. Um, but there's still that 1%, I don't mean to be disrespectful for the general public, um, but there's the idiot factor that you can't control. And that is, that is the lady with her pushchair in the balloons. Um, or somebody doing something suddenly, and that's the real difficulty. Um, I, I show Rams, and we have a little signpost, which is, this sheep's name is Norman. He's had a long day. Please don't touch him unless you have expressed permission. And then many people come along and go, Pat, Norman, and Norman just goes, boom, like that, and I just go, right, okay. So um, I think you need to know your cattle very well. I think... I think we should get to a point where youngsters shouldn't be handling them, at least without a, an assistant with them, so that you're ready on the end of the rope. Um, uh, because a small child cannot anchor away. And we did have our, our local show. We had some, something that actually then just, just went. And it, we had a, he was probably 14, but this animal just decided to go. And then that, may, that is the big risk, because then it's loose and, 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 and difficult. Um, so we had a situation at the Royal Welch again this is not thinking somebody had just won the heifer championship beef championship they were all ecstatic there's big rosettes and sashes and hugs and tears and the rest of the line just then started to head back towards the cattle lines and I'm sitting there going uh oh but because we are so in embraced in what's happening and you could see the heifer she stood there bless her little heart she stood for a good five minutes while the rest went away. And bless her heart, she stood for nearly five or ten minutes. But you could see the tail had started to go and she was getting a bit like, and the next minute she said, right, I'm off, boom, and away she went. Now that to me is bad stockmanship. Either get your mates to stay in the ring with you so that we've got something together, or forget the rope and just let's get out of the ring. Yeah, and that, that's about what's doing right for the animal.
but sometimes we just get a bit carried away. The same at the Royal Welch, we had a, a sick animal came into isolation and they left the gate out open on the isolation and they hadn't put the top bars over and I'm trimming sheep and I'm thinking, oops. So I just sneaked across and put the top rail over and shut the gate and somebody said, what are you doing? I said, well, I know she's sick but she's on her own and the likelihood of her coming over the door and out across the, is a possibility, is it not? Engaged brain. Yeah, I mean, I've, we're farmers here, you know, and, and, and this is what's good about coming to your, sorry, in a bog standard farm, is because actually if you take people to all singing, all dancing thing, it doesn't work. But I had one farmer came back and all he says, Miriam, all I've done is gone home, turned the system round, made it go anti-clockwise and got myself a flag. Absolutely cost nothing. And also, just gone through the system and mentally on, on, a, on a Sunday morning gone, right, how do I get out? How do I get out? How do I get out? God forbid. But how do I get out of this? And just, just taking that approach to a little bit more dynamic risk, that doesn't cost any money at all. That doesn't cost any money at all. Uh, and that's a, that's a key bit. I was on a farm in um, Warrington next to the prison and uh, we were doing an event there, a big, big finishing bulls. And um, as we got, walked round the corner to see um, an old sleeper wall, a little crush, a hurdle tied two places, always tie it four places by the way, because that means one gives way, you're still all right. And, um, and I walked around and I think I did use an expletive, like you've got to be kidding. And he'd got work staff on. And so it turns out this guy had had his leg pinned in 40 places. So anyway, we got round to the discussion about the cost of ev doing everything, so I hauled his wife in. And I said, right, how much is this man worth to you? 10,000? 15,000? And I said, you know what? He's, he's going to be more expensive if he's half alive. And you could see everybody just went a little bit white and I goes, that's what you need to be thinking about. So if you can't afford to do things, you've got to work safely. And there's a huge difference between being a massive risk taker. There's lots of people are very, very safe in what seems like dangerous positions because mentally they're working out the risk. Sometimes you can have people, particularly youngsters, working in very safe positions with very safe things but because they're big risk takers, they're going to be an accident liability. So it's not about the equipment you have, it's about this bit up here. You know, because you can put all the safety devices into tractors and what have you, but if you put an idiot in the driving seat, you're going to come unstuck. A court, uh, I was in a court once against another expert witness and the judge asked the other expert witness on the defence side how often he'd been kicked by a cow and he went three or four hundred times probably it's part of the job he didn't realize the judge was actually a was a big huntsman and he did a lot of riding so that was fine you know this oh yeah getting kicked is part of the job yeah we all get kicked and then he came to me he goes well miss parker how often did you get kicked you know how often have you been kicked and i said probably about 10 maybe at the most and after that I learned to stand out of the way <laughs> you know and 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 it is this you know you know working around horses or cows or sheep or anything you sort of and that's because I'm a coward basically so I don't mind admitting it good good <laughs>